Hi there. Um, right, it's Tuesday um, and we're going to do some English. So um, if you remember, we started reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and we made some plot points um, behind me here. Um, it seems to have crept forwards a little bit. So we're going to do um, the next little bit now. So we're up to chapter five, The Golden Ticket. So grab your copy if you've got one. If not, listen in. Um, maybe you've got your notepad so you can make some notes, okay? And I'll show you what I'm going to do behind here so you can um, copy mine if you need to. Okay, so chapter five, The Golden Tickets. You mean people are actually going to be allowed to go inside the factory, cried Jack, Grandpa Joe. Read us what it says quickly. All right, said Mr. Bucket, smoothing out the newspaper. Listen. Evening bulletin. Mr. Willy Wonka, the confectionery genius, whom nobody has seen for the last 10 years, sent out the following notice today. I, Willy Wonka, have decided to allow five children, just five, mind you, and no more, to visit my factory this year. These lucky five will be shown around personally by me, and they will be allowed to see all the secrets and the magic of my factory. And then at the end of the tour, as a special present, all of them will be given enough chocolates and sweets to last for the rest of their lives. So, watch out for the golden tickets. Five golden tickets have been printed on golden paper and these five golden tickets have been hidden underneath the ordinary wrapping paper of five ordinary bars of chocolate. These five chocolate bars might be anywhere, in any shop, in any street, in any town, in any country, anywhere in the world, upon any counter where Wonka's sweets are sold. And the five lucky finders of these golden tickets are the only ones who will be allowed to visit my factory and see what it's like now inside. Good luck to you all and happy hunting. Signed, Willy Wonka. The man's gone dotty, muttered Grandma Josephine. He's brilliant, cried Grandpa Joe. He's a magician. Just imagine what will happen now. The whole world will be searching for those golden tickets. Everyone will be buying Wonka's chocolate bars in the hope of finding one. He'll sell more than ever before. Oh, how exciting it would be to find one. And all the chocolates and sweets that you could eat for the rest of your life. Free, said Grandpa George. Just imagine that. They'd have to deliver them in a truck, said Grandma Georgina. It makes me quite ill to think of it, said Grandma Josephine. Nonsense, cried Grandpa Joe. Wouldn't it be something, Charlie, to just open a bar of chocolate and see a golden ticket glistening inside? It certainly would, Grandpa. But there isn't hope, Charlie said sadly. I only get one bar a year. You never know, darling, said Grandma Georgina. It's your birthday next week. You have as much chance as anybody else. I'm afraid that simply isn't true, said Grandpa George. The kids who are going to find the golden tickets are the ones who can afford to buy bars of chocolate every day. Our Charlie only gets one a year. There isn't a hope. Right, so that's the end of chapter five. So you can either get yourself a new piece of paper or carry on with the one that you used yesterday. I do need to move this over a little bit then. So. Um, there we go. A bit further back there. Right, brilliant. So, chapter five. The golden ticket or tickets. In fact, it's five golden tickets, isn't it? Five golden tickets hidden in Wonka bars. Uh, winners receive tour of factory plus a lifetime supply of sweets and chocolates. And then let's just think about Charlie. Charlie is feeling a bit dejected, isn't he, at the end of this chapter because 
because he only gets one ticket, um, one chocolate bar a year. One shock bar a year. Doesn't have to be your best handwriting, yes, it's just notes. Right, so that's our first plot point for today. Right, chapter six, which is called The First Two Finders. Here we go. The very next day, the first golden ticket was found. The finder was a boy called Augustus Gloop, and Mr Bucket's evening newspaper carried a large picture of him. On the front page, the picture showed a nine-year-old boy who was so enormously fat, he looked as though he'd been blown up with a powerful pump. Great flabby folds of fat bulged out from every part of his body, and his face was like a monstrous ball of dough with two small, greedy, currenty eyes peering out upon the world. The town in which Augustus Gloop lived, the newspaper said, had gone wild with excitement over their hero. Flags were flying from all the windows, children had been given a holiday from school, and a parade was being organised in honour of the famous youth. I just knew Augustus would find a ticket, his mother had told the newspaperman. He eats so many bars of chocolate every day that it was almost impossible for him not to find one. Eating is his hobby, you know. That's all he's interested in. But still, that's better than being a hooligan and shooting off zip guns and things like that in his spare time, isn't it? And what I say is, he wouldn't go on eating like he does unless he needed the nourishment, would he? It's all vitamins anyway. What a thrill it will be for him to visit Mr Wonka's marvellous factory. We're just as proud as anything. What a revolting woman, said Grandpa, Grandma Josephine. Look, there's Augustus and his mum. He's not very healthy, is he? And what a repulsive boy, said Grandma Georgina. Only four tickets left, said Grandpa George. I wonder who'll get those. And now the whole country, indeed, the whole world, seemed to be caught up in a mad chocolate spree, spree, buying spree, everybody searching frantically for those precious remaining tickets. Fully grown women were seen going into sweet shops and buying 10 Wonka bars at a time, then tearing wrappers on the spot and peering eagerly underneath for a glint of golden paper. Children were taking hammers and smashing their piggy banks and running out to the shops with handfuls of money. In one city, a famous gangster robbed a bank of a thousand pounds and spent the whole lot on Wonka bars that same afternoon. And when the police entered his house to arrest him, they found him sitting on the floor amidst mountains of chocolate, ripping off wrappers with the blade of a long dagger. In far-off Russia, a woman called Charlotte Roos claimed to have found the second ticket, but it turned out to be a clever fake. The famous English scientist, Professor Fowlbody, invented a machine which would tell you at once without opening the wrapper of a bar of chocolate whether or not there was a golden ticket hidden underneath it. The machine had a mechanical arm that shot out with tremendous force and grabbed hold of anything that had the slightest bit of gold inside it. And for a moment, it looked like the answer to everything. But unfortunately, while the professor was showing off the machine to the public at the sweet count of a large department store, the mechanical arm shot out and made a grab for the gold filling in the back tooth of a duchess who was standing nearby. There was an ugly scene and the machine was smashed by the crowd. Suddenly, on the day before Charlie Bucket's birthday, the newspapers announced that the second golden ticket had been found. The lucky person was a small girl called Veruca Salt, who lived with her rich parents in a great city far away. Once again, Mr Bucket's evening newspaper carried a big picture. There she is. So that's Veruca Salt. She was sitting between her beaming father and mother in the living room of their house, waving the golden ticket above her head and grinning from ear to ear. Veruca fa Veruca's father, Mr Salt, had eagerly explained to the newspaperman exactly how the ticket was found. You see, boys, he said, as soon as my little girl told me that she simply had to have one of those golden tickets, I went out into the town and I started buying up all the Wonka bars. I bought thousands of them, hundreds of thousands, and then I loaded them onto my trucks and sent them directly to my own factory. 
I'm in the peanut business, you see, and I've got about 100 women working for me over at my place, shelling peanuts and roasting and salting. That's what they do all day long. Those women, they sit there shelling peanuts. So I says to them, I says, girls, I says, from now on, you can stop shelling peanuts and start shelling wrappers off the chocolate bars instead. And they did. I had every worker in the place yanking the paper off those chocolate bars at full speed from morning till night. But three days went by and we had no luck. Oh, it was terrible. My little Veruca got more and more upset every day. And every time I went home, she would scream at me, where's my golden ticket? I want my golden ticket. And she would lie for hours on the floor, kicking and yelling in the most disturbing way. Well, I just hated to see my little girl feeling unhappy like that. So I vowed I would keep up the search until I got her what she wanted. And then suddenly, on the evening of the fourth day, one of my women workers yelled, I've got it, a golden ticket. And I said, give it to me quick. And she did. And I rushed home and I gave it to my darling Veruca. And now she's all smiles and we have a happy home once again. That's even worse than the fat boy, said Grandma Josephine. She needs a really good spanking, said Grandma Georgina. I don't think the girl's father played it quite fair, Grandpa, do you? Charlie murmured. He spoils her, Grandpa Joe said. And no good can ever come from spoiling a child like that, Charlie. Mark my words. Come to bed, my darling, said Charlie's mother. Tomorrow's your birthday. Don't forget that. So I expect you'll be up early to open your present. A Wonka chocolate bar, is it? cried Charlie. It is. It's a Wonka chocolate bar, isn't it? Yes, my love, his mother said. Of course it is. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I found the third golden ticket inside, Charlie said. Bring it in here when you get it, Grandpa Joe said, and then we can all watch you taking off the wrapper. Right, so that's the end of chapter six. And we've had two more tickets found, haven't we? Okay, so the first ticket was found by Augustus Gloop, who's a big, fat, greedy boy. And the second ticket was found by Veruca Salt, who's a spoiled girl. Put that in bracket so you can be doing this on your notes as well. Fat greedy boy. Obviously we would never call somebody a fat or greedy person or spoiled for that matter to their faces because it's important that we're kind, okay? Right, so moving on to chapter seven. Here we go. Chapter seven, Charlie's birthday. Happy birthday, cried the four old grandparents as Charlie came into their room early, ne early the next morning. Charlie smiled nervously and sat down on the edge of the bed. He was holding his present, his only present, very carefully in his two hands. Wonka's whipple scrumptious fudge mallow delight, it said on the wrapper. The four old people, two at either end of the bed, propped themselves up on their pillows and stared with anxious eyes at the bar of chocolate in Charlie's hands. Mr and Mrs Bucket came in and stood at the foot of the bed, watching Charlie. The room became silent. Everybody was waiting now for Charlie to start opening his present. Charlie looked down at the bar of chocolate. He ran his fingers slowly back and forth along the shiny paper wrapper and it made little sharp crackly noises in the quiet room. Then Mrs Bucket said gently, you mustn't be too disappointed my darling if you don't find what you're looking for under that wrapper. You really can't expect to be as lucky as all that. She's quite right, Mr Bucket said. Charlie didn't say anything. After all, Grandma Josephine said, in the whole wide world, there are only three tickets left to be found. The thing to remember, Grandma Georgina said, is that whatever happens, you'll still have a bar of chocolate. Wonka's whipple scrumptious fudge mallow delight, cried Grandpa George. It's the best of them all. You'll love it. Yes, Charlie. 
Just forget about all those golden tickets and enjoy the chocolate, Grandpa Joe said. Why don't you do that? They all knew it was ridiculous to expect this one poor little bar of chocolate to have a magic ticket inside it. And they were trying as gently and as kindly as they could to prepare Charlie for the disappointment. But there was also one other thing that the grown-ups knew, and this was that. However small the chance might be of striking Lucky, the chance was there. The chance had to be there. This particular bar of chocolate had as much chance as any other of having a golden ticket. And that was why all the grandparents and parents in the room were actually just as tense and excited as Charlie, although they were pretending to be very calm. You'd better go ahead and open it up or you'll be late for school, Grandpa Joe said. You might as well get it over with, Grandpa George said. Open it, my dear, Grandma Georgina said. Please open it, you're making me very jumpy. Very slowly, Charlie's fingers began to tear open one small corner of the wrapping paper. The old people in the bed all leaned forward, craning their scraggy necks. Then suddenly, as though he couldn't bear the suspense any longer, Charlie tore the wrapper right down the middle and onto his lap. There fell a light brown, creamy coloured bar of chocolate. There was no sign of a golden ticket anywhere. Well, that's that, said Grandpa Joe brightly. It's just what we expected. Charlie looked up. Four kind old faces were watching him intently from the bed. He smiled at them, a small, sad smile. And then he shrugged his shoulders, picked up the chocolate bar and held it out to his mother. Here, mother, have a bit. We'll share it. I want everybody to taste it. Certainly not, said his mother. And the others all cried, no, 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 no. We wouldn't dream of it. It's all yours. Please, begged Charlie, turning round and offering it to Grandpa Joe. But neither he nor anyone else would even take a tiny bit. It's time to go to school, my darling, Mrs Bucket said, putting an arm around Charlie's skinny shoulders. Come on, or you'll be late. Right, so chapter seven was Charlie's birthday. And for his birthday, he was given a chocolate bar. But there was no golden ticket. So again, Charlie's feeling a bit sad at the end of that chapter. Um, and now we're going to move on to chapter eight, okay? And then we'll leave it there again for today, I think. Yes. Right, so chapter eight, two more golden tickets found. That evening, Mr. Bucket's newspaper announced the finding of not only the third golden ticket, but the fourth as well. Two golden tickets found today, screamed the headlines. Only one more left. All right, said Grandpa Joe when the whole family was gathered in the old people's room after supper. Let's hear who's found them then. The third ticket, read Mr Bucket, holding up the newspaper close to his face because his eyes were bad and he couldn't afford glasses. The third ticket was found by a Miss Violet Beauregard. There was great excitement in the Beauregard household when our reporter arrived to interview the lucky young lady. Cameras were clicking and flash bulbs were flashing and people were pushing and jostling and trying to get a bit closer to the famous girl. And the famous girl was standing on a chair in the living room waving the golden ticket madly at arm's length as though she was flagging a taxi. She was talking very fast and very loudly to everyone, but it was not easy to hear all that she said because she was chewing ferociously upon a piece of gum at the same time. I'm a gum chewer normally, she shouted, but when I heard about these ticket things of Mr Wonka's, I gave up gum and started on chocolate bars in the hope of striking Lucky. Now, of course, I'm back on gum. 
I just adore gum. I can't do without it. I munch it all day long except for a few minutes at meal times when I take it out and stick it behind my ear for safekeeping. To tell you the truth, I simply wouldn't feel comfortable if I didn't have that little wedge of gum to chew on every moment of the day. I really wouldn't. My mother says it's not ladylike and it looks ugly to see a girl's jaws going up and down. Nom, 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 nom like mine do all the time, but I don't agree. And who's she to criticise anyway? Because if you ask me, I'd say that her jaws are going up and down almost as much as mine are just from yelling at me every minute of the day. Now, Violet, Mrs Beauregard said from a far corner of the room where she was standing on a piano to avoid being trampled by the mob. Now, Violet. All right, mother, keep your hair on, Miss Beauregard shouted. And now, she went on, turning to the reporters again, it may inter interest you to know that this piece of gum I'm chewing on right at this moment, I've been working on it for over three months solid. That's a record, that is. It's beaten the record held by my best friend, Miss Cornelia Prince Metal. And she was furious. It's my most treasured possession now, this piece of gum is. At night, I just stick it on the end of the bedpost and it's as good as new in the morning. A bit hard at first, maybe, but it soon softens up again after I've given it a few good chews. Before I start my chewing for the world record, I used to change my piece of gum once a day. I used to do it in our lift on the way home from school. Why the lift? Because I liked sticking the gooey piece that I'd just finished with onto one of the control buttons. Then the next person who came along and pressed the button got my old piece of gum on his finger. <laughs> and what a racket they kicked up, some of them. You get the best results from women who have the expensive gloves on. Oh, yes, I'm thrilled to be going to Mr Wonka's factory. And I understand that afterwards he's going to give me enough gum to last me for the rest of my life. Whoopee! Hooray! Beastly girl, said Grandma Josephine. Despicable, said Grandma Georgina. She'll come to a sticky end one day chewing all that gum. See if she doesn't. And who got the fourth golden ticket? Charlie asked. Now, let me see, said Mr Bucket, peering at the newspaper again. Ah, oh, yes, here we are. The fourth golden ticket, he read, was found by a boy called Mike TV. Another bad lot, I'll be bound, muttered Grandma Josephine. Don't interrupt, Grandma, said Mrs Bucket. The TV household, said Mr Bucket, going on with his reading, was crammed like all the other visitors with, sorry, like all the others with exciting visit, excited visitors when our reporter arrived. But young Mike TV, the lucky winner, seemed extremely annoyed by the whole business. Can't you fools see I'm watching television, he said angrily. I wish you wouldn't interrupt. The nine-year-old boy was seated before an enormous television set with his eyes glued to the screen and he was watching a film in which one bunch of gangsters was shooting up another bunch of gangsters with machine guns. Mike TV himself had no less than 18 toy pistols of various sizes hanging from belts around his body and every now and again he would leap up into the air and fire off half a dozen rounds from one or another of these weapons. Quiet! he shouted when someone tried to ask him a question. Didn't I tell you not to interrupt? This show's an absolute whiz-banger. It's terrific. I watch it every day. I watch all of them every day, even the rotten ones, when there's no shooting. I like the gangsters the best. They're terrific, those gangsters, especially when they start pumping each other full of lead or flashing the old stilettos or giving each other the one, two, three with their knuckle dusters. Gosh, what wouldn't I give to be going in myself? That's the life, I tell you. It's terrific. That's quite enough, snapped Grandma Josephine. I can't bear to listen to it. Nor me, said Grandma Georgina. Do all children behave like that nowadays? Like these brats we've been hearing about? Of course not, said Mr Bucket, smiling at the old lady in bed. Some do, of course. In fact, quite a lot of them do, but not all. And now there's only one ticket left, said Grandpa George. Quite so, sniffed Grandma Georgina. And just as sure as I'll be having cabbage soup for supper tomorrow, that ticket will go to some nasty little beast who doesn't deserve it. And that's the end of chapter eight. OK, so chapter eight. Two more lucky ticket finders. We had Violet Beauregard. Beauregard. 
who is a gum chewer. She was a bit rude to her mum. I didn't like the sound of her, did you? And then Mike TV. Who's obsessed with television. And also a bit rude and a bit nasty. So, one ticket left. And that, my friends, is a brilliant place to leave a chapter because it's a bit of a cliffhanger because what you want to do is you want to carry on reading, don't you? You want to see what's going to happen next in chapter nine. But you can't because that's the end of the English lesson today. So do your plot point notes like mine. You can put some pictures on it if you like. You can do your notes in a different way if, um, if you found a, a better way, like Eloise had a different way, didn't she, yesterday? And then tomorrow we'll carry on. And we'll find out what happens in chapter nine when Grandpa Joe takes a gamble. And then we'll find out what happens in chapter 10. Ooh, let me see what chapter 10 is called. Hold on. Chapter 10, the family begins to starve. Oh, gosh. And then chapter 11, the miracle. Okay. I wonder what happens in the miracle. Can you guess? I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway. Time for you lot to um, have some lunch now, probably, if you're doing this in order. And um, I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.